Good morning. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, but God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated, and Kids Point is dismissed. All right. (laughs) I like how Bethany lowered this like she was three foot three. (laughs) All right. Uh, Well, I'll uh, just welcome our speaker up at this point. Um, You know that passage that she just read? There's, when Paul writes, he writes with a combination of Uh, clarity, coherence, and logic on the one hand, and then questions and incongruity on the other hand. They kind of travel together with Paul. Sometimes you're like, he is really, really clear and lucid and and almost algorithmic in his thinking. And in other ways, it's like, how did you go from there? So it makes sense that rejoice, uh, it makes sense, sorry, that suffering produces endurance. It makes sense that endurance produces character. And then Paul starts to like go off on this chain of thought that may not be as smooth, which is character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. And so somehow shame is resolved because love has been poured into our hearts. Somehow hope is produced by character. What, Paul, what are you getting at? What are you getting at here? What are, what are these things? And um, that's just what it means to be Paul. And honestly, that's also what it means for us to travel through life. And that's what it's meant for us to travel through, honestly, this series. This is the last of the 10 people that I have Uh, been the point people during this series. And as I was told at the beginning, point people is everyone that visits and everyone that is sitting here and everyone who walks through our doors, right? Like you are a meaningful member of this community. You are a point person um, by your presence and presence alone. Uh, We've also asked 10 people to share their stories and give a window into what God has done through their lives and what he is still doing, right? There's not a period at the end of our sentences. There's like an ellipsis. There is a, a work in progress. Um, and Roger uh, Solima is going to be our final uh, storyteller for this season. And for these last nine weeks, you've seen a combination of things and people telling their stories where it's like, oh, that makes sense. And then, oh, like, there's some questions that have emerged through their story. There's some real painful difficulties that have emerged through their story. There is some, some things that just, Lord, I don't see how you got from point A to point B there, but, but you did. Um, and so not only is uh, coherence um, and incongruity kind of the way that Paul speaks, it's also the way in which God works, and it's also the way that kind of our life uh, issues forth. It's a combination of uh, the sensible and the absurd. Um, and so that, that sense of tension is something that in many ways we have seen over the last nine weeks And it is a good thing for us to keep in mind as we go forward. What does it mean to live life in tension? Um, Roger is going to introduce a tension that I think is going to be really helpful for us as we close out this series and then chart a course towards our fall, which you'll hear more about next week. And so at this time, uh, I want you guys to give a warm welcome to Roger as he shares his story. And as, as each Sunday for the last nine Sundays... Think about what you want to respond to. Questions, comments, encouragements, even challenges. Um, That's your part. But I'm going to allow Roger to come up here and do his part right now. So give him a warm welcome. Yes, please. Good morning. Hi. Um, let's just get started. What is up? Um, <laughs> as you can see, I'm, I'm opting for holding the mic. I know we've had different variations of people keeping on the stand, the Britney Spears mic. I'm, I'm taking a book out of Dave's book because I think for the same reason, we're not used to being up here without something in our hands, like a guitar as some kind of physical barrier between us and congregation. 
Um, so thank, I want to thank everyone for coming out, um, especially those that I invited. And I do want to point out that the act of me inviting anyone is actually a pretty big deal, but we'll touch on that a little later. And getting right into it, I want to um, just give some background about myself. Oh, that's thank you for coming. <laughs> Remember, to, I have to click, click through the slides. Um, I'll give some background about myself and give you to get an idea of who I am. I'll share some, some fun stories, some sad stories. And I want to touch on how these snippets from my life have shaped who I am and why I believe they have value and I think the ways they are tied to the gospel. Um, I'll then conclude with some calls to action. Um, I I believe we have reiterated that the point of Point People series is to challenge us as people and as a church um, while getting to know each other on a deeper level. And spoiler alert, the calls to action, they're not going to be easy. Um, but once I'm done sharing, I'm hoping that's going to be prevalent for why that's the entire point. So to start things off, I'll share some information to paint a picture of the kind of person I am and once was. <laughs> so this is just to give you guys an image of a version of Roger in the past life. I also want to reflect on how much hair I have <laughs> lived in, in the past. And, and I just want to, I guess, just, just show how comfortable I was um, doing the bare minimum in life and my appearances. And if it goes without saying, yes, I am single in this picture, so <laughs> plenty of lost opportunities for the ladies out there. Um, but this is also a time in my life where I remember feeling very comfortable in my own skin. And I think that's actually a, a very big deal for me because growing up I was a very insecure person. Um, I had low self-esteem and just being you know, okay with this appearance and kind of walking around. This is just bedhead, by the way, because you know, you know, when it gets hot, you want to feel that cool side of the pillow, so it just happens to stay like that for the rest of the day. Another fun fact about myself is that I hate public speaking. So the natural question would be, why am I doing this? And that question comes in two parts. I think number one is just being able to challenge myself, stretch myself, stretch my comfort zone. And number two, I kind of think pro tim tricked me um, that's just suspicion, but uh, I can go into that theory later on if, you, if you're curious. <laughs> and some people may be surprised to hear this, but I do not think I do well or thrive in being in front of a group or congregation, which may sound strange because obviously most people probably know me for being up here um, with a guitar, speaking regularly on a you know, sunny basis. Um, but public speaking and talking about myself is much different than singing with a congregation. And I do want to emphasize the with a congregation part because even though like I'm a musician, I do hate performing. And when singing when no one's singing with you is a lot more difficult than when everyone is singing along. So I'm not used to this scenario, so it's kind of something that we all get to experience together. Um, when agreeing to do this Point People series, all the speakers were encouraged to invite people. And like I mentioned, um, I did invite some people up here in the front and just throughout, even on Instagram, like, you know, just putting out a story, saying I'm speaking tomorrow, come out if you can. And as simple as that sounds, um, that is a very big step for me. Because another fun fact about myself is that I was actually a music major in college. Um, I thought it was a common thing, but when I was speaking to Lydia like a month ago, she was completely surprised. So I was a music education major. My instrument was classical voice. And like all music majors, before you graduate, you have to do a senior recital. So for most um, music majors, that's a very big deal. Actually, music major, recital hall. <laughs> um, so a lot of music majors will tend to have like, you know, create a Facebook group, invite all their friends, their family, their friends' friends, their family's friends, um, hand out flyers, post up posters, all that jazz, and they want to see this recital hall, you know, filled to the max if possible. And I have one of my closest family members here today in the congregation, my cousin Justine. I'm going to ask her a quick question. What did you think of my recital? Um, I <laughs> yes, I did not invite her. That was a trick question. <laughs> One of the closest family members in the world had no idea when it was or that it even existed. Um, I actually had six people at my recital. It was Lisa, my, my, my now wife, my mom, my dad, my voice teacher, my voice coach, and myself. So <laughs> that was the entire crowd. And I think the day of my voice teacher must have felt like super bad for me because, you know, they're typically used to seeing, you know, people coming in and she's probably like, oh, crap, no one's here. Just like 
everyone hate Roger or something, like secretly? And I says, oh no, it's fine. I didn't invite anybody. Like I didn't advertise at all. And you know, she looks back and is like, I guess I didn't see any posters around the school because they're usually plastered everywhere. And I, she, when she asked why, I just said, because that would mean there'd be a higher likelihood of people coming. And that was less ideal for me. This is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> And the amount of people that came to your recital actually had no effect on your grade, so I had no issue performing for an audience of three. And the reason I tell you this story is because it's to reiterate and show how much of a challenge this experience is. From agreeing to do it, to inviting anyone at all, and to actually stand here before you talking about myself. Which leads us to our scripture, just to review. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And I think it's amazing whenever you hear of a, an idea or concept and just see how much it applies to different areas of your life. Uh, you know, why would anyone want to rejoice in sufferings? And I feel like just the idea of reframing the way you think about things as negative experiences is just that idea where stepping out of your comfort zone may not really be considered suffering, but it is definitely a negative experience. And by design definition, we have an aversion to the discomfort of being out of our comfort zone. And one of the biggest lessons that I think I've experienced in life and are reflected in my um, life is the value of hardships. That there can be value in challenging yourself, there can be opportunities to grow from loss, and that you can have positive outcomes out of negative experiences. Um, so growing up, I was a moderate reader. That's a lie, I hated reading. I like never read. If I, if I didn't have to read for school, I never did it at all. But at some point I just realized that I never found books that I liked. You know, outside of the typical things that you learn in English that you read. Um, which was why this quote really spoke to me when I first heard it. That's a Indian American entrepreneur investor. That made complete sense. Read what you love until you love to read. Uh, this was his advice for people that didn't like reading, which was exactly who I was a couple years ago. But the prerequisite is finding out that you love to read. And you have to actually take the step into reading things to find things that you love to read. And that step alone was pretty difficult because I hated reading and reading made me feel dumb. Um, I had a great tight knit group of friends growing up. They're all super smart. They were the, the AP class, the honor students. I was just a tall, funny one. And now like I actually have I actually took a page out of Amy Kenfield's book and started a book club at work. You know, I, I try to read on a regular basis. And I even have a favorite author, just uh, by design, because I've read the most books by him. This is Malcolm Gladwell, and he wrote this book called David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. And one of the topics he covers is the idea of desirable difficulty. And the concept explains that there's an optimal amount of difficulty and effort that's ideal for learning. So generally when you're learning something, if it's too easy, it can get kind of boring. There's not much use out of it. You don't really have any motivation to keep going on. So the result is that you don't learn anything. But if it's too hard, you get discouraged and don't even want to try. I think um, for anyone that likes video games, that's like the, the prime example of what desirable difficulty is supposed to look like. You know, when you start out playing a video game, it's pretty easy, it's kind of interesting, but as you beat each level, it gets harder and harder. So you get more motivated because it's gratifying when you get better at it, and you just keep going on, it makes it enjoyable. And the net result is that you're a better player. And as cheesy it sounds, I think it pretty much applies to the, the game of life as well, that there are things that you can go through in life, and desirable difficulty is a tool that pretty much, it's an element of your character development as people. An example that he has in the book was losing a parent early in life. Um, real life examples, you know, Winston Churchill, Martin Luther King Jr., among other historical figures, had lost parents early in life. And the book makes the case that people who experience hardships like losing a loved one um, can develop a resilience, determination, and the ability to navigate challenges. But it's because they're forced to. Um, so it's obviously not the same kind of hardship as learning something academically or playing a video game, but it's just the idea that there can be positive outcomes and opportunities out of, out of negative experiences. Which leads me to the most personal story of my life. Uh, 
Uh, ooh. When people see baby pictures of me, they, they're usually surprised by how pale I was and how full my eyebrows were because nowadays, that's not so much the case. Uh, but obviously I share this picture because of the other person in it, and that is my mom. She died from cancer in 2017. And you could say that this was a defining moment in my life, and it'd be a huge understatement. You know, there's a life before my mom and a life after she died. And you could even say that there was a Roger before my mom and a Roger after she died. And as hard as it was to lose her, her sickness and death was such a huge catalyst to my journey into professional development, into personal development. It made me look internally to find ways to improve as a person. I think about the kind of son I was, reflect on those mistakes as fuel to become a better person. The kind of son that she could be proud of and the kind of son she wouldn't have to worry about after leaving. So I'm not sure if you're familiar or been around people that have been terminally ill, but I think the hardest part for them is worrying about how their loved ones will be after they're gone. And I want to live the kind of life where she would never have to worry about that. Sharing and talking to my mom is a challenge for me. I've always considered someone that's been decent at controlling their emotions, uh, but the truth is that I'm good at compartmentalizing things. I don't let myself feel my emotions because I just put it to the side. I am very easy to keep my mind off things if I don't want to think about it. But I can't learn to control my emotions if I don't let myself feel them. So for me, public speaking is a desirable difficulty. Inviting people is a desirable difficulty. And right now, this moment, talking about my mom, just doing what I'm doing right now is a desirable difficulty. It's not so easy that I don't get anything out of it, but it's hard enough that I know it's helped me grow as a person. And I want to rejoice in this suffering because Romans 5 says that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. But I also know that there is more to this that I'm getting out of it by sharing this story. I think that even by when we take acts of faith and stepping out of our comfort zone, that there are external benefits, third party people that can also benefit from it as well. Three months ago after Mother's Day, I shared for the first time during our congregational sharing. Um, that was a desirable difficulty. I'm definitely the type of person that's kind of fine sitting back, being very passive, and just letting people, you know, talk out and sit in silence. Uh, but that week I shared about how thankful I was for Lisa because she helped me realize how much I hadn't addressed my grief about my mom dying. And sharing about how hard that Mother's Day was this year actually led to Marvin reaching out to me after service to share about the loss of his own loved ones in life. As we've heard, you know, during his Point People Sunday in July, that actually led us to meeting for dinner my first mandate in a while. <laughs> he paid for dinner, he was a complete gentleman. <laughs> um, but it, it was honestly the first time I just really got to share my feelings with someone outside of my family who had similar experience of losses. But that idea, just encouraging, I just want to encourage people to step out of the comfort zone and challenge yourself because this is only my second public speaking experience, I think, since college, you know, in adulthood. The first one was, um, the best band toast at my best friend's wedding was something everyone can be familiar with, whether you've watched it, good ones, bad ones, really bad ones, horrible ones. And like a lot of guys, I didn't really take it very seriously, um, with the preparations, but thankfully, I have a wife. And uh, Lisa asked me maybe a week before the wedding or a couple days before the wedding if I prepared my speech. I didn't really. Um, I thought maybe I could wing it because, like most men, I gr can greatly overestimate my abilities. <laughs> but having a wife, 
Lisa immediately put me, my, put me in my place by saying, you should probably practice. You're not a good public speaker. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's Lisa. That's my sad face. Because <laughs> honestly, just practicing something you're not good at is a desirable difficulty. You're basically admitting that you're subpar, you're inadequate at this thing, and practicing things that we're not good at is uncomfortable. You know, we like to stick to things that we're good at because it's self-gratifying. I want to do it more because it makes me feel good. And like we've established before, people tend to avoid negative experiences. You know, doing things you suck at are negative experiences. It sucks to suck. But the only way you get better at doing things is by doing it. And Lisa's been a huge catalyst for my personal development and my professional development. Um, I'm a simple guy. I am quick to find contentness with a lot of things, including work. Um, but every new position I've had in my career can be attributed to Lisa because she pushed me to apply for every new role I've gotten uh, before I thought I was ready for it. And I think I've gotten progressively better at my job and I've enjoyed each role more and more in my career. But what does desirable difficulty look like for us in our church? You know, what is the call to action? It doesn't have to be complicated. I think starting small is best. Uh, maybe it's as simple as sharing, sharing during congregational sharing. It could be maybe just thinking throughout the week, what's something I could share at church on Sunday and maybe not even share that baby stuff, just trying to keep that in mind. Uh, maybe a desirable difficulty is being open to serving at church. I promise Howie did not tell me to say that. <laughs> you know, during Howie's Point People Sunday, he said that people are free to say no to serving with the encouragement to say yes to something else. And honestly, if you say yes at first and it's not for you, just say no. I don't mind. That's how he's problem. <laughs> or maybe something out of your comfort zone could be talking to a new person on Sunday instead of the same people you see that you're comfortable with. You know, welcoming someone new, um, they're coming through and just even inviting people to church. You know, I think uh, that was a great opportunity for this, sun, this series to invite people that we don't typically see. Um, just to hear our stories, hear other people's stories. Uh, here's a fun one. Maybe a desirable difficulty is having conversations about heated and charged topics with people that don't agree with everything you believe in. Yeah. Obviously, that's to be done in a healthy environment with people with good rapport. Uh, and honestly, if, if talking to people directly is too hard, I think even just taking the baby step of researching maybe counter arguments, challenging your own beliefs, Watch some videos, listen to some podcasts, read some books to help broaden your perspective. But the point is that it has to challenge you. It has to be difficult. It has to be uncomfortable. Because if it's too easy, you may not be getting a lot out of it. Try to see things from other people's perspective instead of dismissing complete ideas and people group. It takes a lot of humility and open-mindedness. So have tough conversations. Step out of your comfort zone. And don't wait to fight the right answer. Do something that can lead to it. And like I said in the beginning, that these calls to actions are not easy, but uh, that's exactly why I think it's worth it. Thank you. All right. I want to say something first. Uh, thank you, uh, Roger, for just blending weight and levity so seamlessly. Um, I, I'm taking tips on even how to like present things with the, with the kind of skill you just did. Um, if you're looking at your clock right now and you're thinking, man, we're late in the service, remember, kids didn't get taken back there until like 15 minutes ago. So we're fine is what I'm trying to say. So at this point, I want to give you guys an opportunity to respond uh, to what um, Roger has shared. If you are someone over the last nine weeks who have been thinking, ah, I want to say something, but, and you've given yourself a reason not to, this might be your little installment of desirable difficulty. So I'm going to start with, I think Joanne's chomping in the bit to ask something. Um, we've heard from Joanne before, and we're going to hear from her right now. But if we haven't heard from you, maybe this will be your little uh, deposit in the uh, desirable difficulty piggy bank. I just want to make an observation. Mm -hmm. And this may not be good news to you, but you are a really good public speaker. Yeah. <laughs> you are really good. I mean, it's Lisa's fault. there was so much uh, thought and organization, and you said the humor is amazing and your natural flow. You know, it just may be that God was going to ask you to do this more. 
because I really, really appreciated it. Thank you. It's Lisa's fault. She made me practice stuff because, because I was really bad before. So Roger, thanks for sharing. Um, my question is, as far as with music, like how has that helped in terms of like some of the hard stuff or just your relationship and with God in general? Did you like fall into music or did you feel like that was your calling or? Um, being Filipino, <laughs> as the Filipinos can, can attest to, they, we've, we've really encouraged like singing and stuff. So singing was always a part of my life, but I, I had never enjoyed performance and like being in front of people singing, as you can, like, Justin can testify, I rarely do karaoke. But um, I think being introduced into um, like church and having that avenue to, to express music, it was pretty, pretty much like what got me really into it and sunk in. And leading worship never felt like a performance. So I feel like that, was, that actually did come pretty easy, but any other scenario where I have to sing in, or play an instrument in front of people that's outside of like a church context is very nerve wracking, as you could have seen at my recital, but thankfully you were not there. <laughs> I would like to go back to where you said that it's, you like to go to have conversations or discussions mm -hmm. on areas where people don't want to talk about. Right. You, you know we live in a society that's really polarized, so yeah. how do you deal with that challenge? Because I like to go there, and mm -hmm. then when my wife is next to me, she's like, don't go there. So <laughs> how do you deal with that? It, it takes time. Um, like I mentioned, like, I think having the right rapport is really important. And I guess even to share some of my experiences, um, sometimes it's hard to come out as Christian. And like at work especially, I actually had a job that I applied for where I had a friend recommended I leave my church stuff out of my resume, just because you never really know how it can be taken. So I know when I've talked to people at work, make friends with them, I, I do like little, I, I find little, little ways to test their temperament on certain topics and then let myself go there if I feel like it's a safe and healthy environment where they're not gonna cast me out for, for going to church on Sunday, essentially. But um, yeah, it definitely takes time. It's not something that can be rushed. So a lot of that would be me. I, I've done a lot of research on, on different things and taken both sides of the debate. And I think that definitely helps with how those conversations can flow uh, because you can see things from their perspective and find ways to connect them if there are any opportunities to find common ground. So, well, th uh, thanks for sharing, Roger. Uh, I just, I'm curious as to whether you've given thought to or um, have ever considered whether the idea of the beneficial difficulty is something that you sort of have always embraced or just and discovered about yourself or learned more recently. Because as I'm sitting here, I just think that a mu being a music major is a very interesting choice for someone that doesn't want to perform or be up in front of people. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like even before you discovered the, this concept, you were already embracing it. Huh. Yeah, I think it's probably something I, I didn't consciously think about until later, in like the past decade, I'll say. Um, it's like, I guess I didn't think about music being part of that, that journey in a way where I hoped it would be a, 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 like, you know, a way that I could develop in certain areas. And I'm sure being up on Sundays playing guitar has helped. If I hadn't had that, then this would probably be even more awkward. So I could say that, yeah, taking that step probably early on, just making that decision, being a music major, um, could be some, some unforeseen foresight that I might have had. But I definitely don't think I had a conscious idea of enjoying it because when I think about the ideal life, you always think, oh, like, I want to have a lot of money and not do anything. You know, like, what, is, what does paradise look like? You know, just like that, the garden and fruit, and like, you don't have to work and stuff. And I definitely have changed my mind of that in the past year that 
the, the biggest meaning that you can have in life is just to find things to do and, and grow from it. And usually growth does take some bit of efforts and effort because things aren't easy. So yeah, it wasn't natural, I would say. Hi, Roger. <laughs> I just wanted to um, just kind of remind us and to thank you that, you know, through the pandemic and through just all the changes that have gone on, like you have been a solid source of, of leadership. And I just want to thank you for that. And I also wanted to say that um, you have grown so much because I remember <laughs> when we were back in um, Villagers Theater, mm -hmm. there were times when um, you would lead worship and then you would pray, and I didn't know what you were saying because <laughs> you would just That's talk really fast and me. really quick, and I wouldn't know what he was praying about. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to say that that you know I just wanted to encourage you that there's growth there, mm -hmm. and um, and just thank you for all that you do for for our church. Thank you. That's the exact example that Lisa would have. It's like, you can't even pray properly in front of <laughs> I am a mumbler. I right. speak too quick sometimes. So first off, Roger, thank you for the courage that it takes to share, to speak in front of everybody. So my question to you is in regards to grieving with other people. So with the caveat of have you grieved with other people I guess recently, or how would you grieve differently with people knowing that in your testimony that you were sharing that your grieving process changed or was significantly helped with Lisa? So with that experience in mind, I don't know if you've grieved recently with somebody or how would you in a future event knowing how you've, I guess, grew in the grieving process? Sorry, I think I haven't grown much. I think just the action of just thinking about it and letting myself feel it is probably like the baby step that I, I'm in right now. Where, I, I, like I mentioned, I, I'm very easy to just change the subject in my mind and don't let myself sit with things if I don't want to think about it. So I think just that step for me to let myself sit in my feelings, um, find avenues to talk about it, I think sharing it today um, I've also been, like open to therapy that I, that I wasn't really before, so I think that's some, probably a good way for me to process my feelings um, a little more detailed and more heavily. But yeah, that's pretty much. All right. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller. Here. Hi. Hello. Um, I just want to thank you for that. Just encouragement and reminder to um, to step out of one's comfort zone. I like my comfort zone. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I also agree with what you were saying, like how it does benefit us and helps us grow. And um, yeah, I'm just thankful for that reminder. And I also like the the baby step sort of approach because sometimes you know you can jump into something like, I'm going to be this, and it's yeah. like, that's just <laughs> unrealistic. So, yeah, it's like small, steady, just keep mm -hmm. moving. That's what I usually tell myself. I'm like, just keep trying to go forward. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even if you're, like, crawling and dragging your leg, which you kind of do because, you know, <laughs> I have a bad knee. Anyway, <laughs> thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Um, as we segue to the table, um, and honestly, as we move forward from, as a church, let's keep that category in mind, uh, desirable difficulty. Um, it's, a, it's not only a helpful tension, it's a biblical one. Um, in many ways, it's even our great enemy knows the value of both desire, desire and difficulty. Um, if you think about the temptations in the wilderness. You can have the crown. Um, just don't do it through the cross. Um, just, just in this moment, just bow down to me and you can have everything. The kingdoms of the world, I'll give it to you. Um, and uh, Jesus picks the desirable difficulty path. 
And I don't know that it's said any better than the author of Hebrews, the, the pastor in the book of Hebrews, says it. And I hope you hear uh, Roger's story in this. I hope you hear his exhortation in this. But I also hope you hear this, uh, the gospel that is embodied at this table through this. Um, because when we come to this table, yes, we reflect on our lives where we, when we draw our comfort zones, uh, where we shun the opportunity zone. I love that slide as well. And then we look to Jesus. And so that's actually how this passage starts. Looking to Jesus. This is Hebrews 12, 2. The founder, I like the entrepreneurial language that's used there of Jesus. The founder and perfecter of our faith. Who for, and listen for it, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, desire and difficulty, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Right? Um, you get crown, but only insofar as it moves through cross. Uh, and so as we come to the table, right, as, as Dave and Roger escort us to the table uh, into a reflective space, reflect to whatever extent um, that charge, that call to action is for you. It is for you. It's for all of us. It's for the we of Point Community Church. What does it look like for starting now, starting even from this moment, for us to take a small, medium, or large step um, that you can sustain and the Lord will help you sustain by His Spirit, through His people, um, a step towards a life of desirable difficulty. And so I'm going to pray and then come when you are ready. Father, um, as we take of these elements, the, the broken bread, uh, the poured out cup, um, we take in the elements of the, the climactic moments of uh, your gospel, your good news. And even to think that we take of bread, we take of something that sustains us, something we savor, something that um, we would love to eat, uh, that, that satisfies us. And yet here it embodies great, great difficulty, great suffering, crushing even. And then this cup that has something that might be sweet and refreshing symbolizes uh, you emptying yourselves to the, to the utmost. And so, Lord, as we come to the table, whether we have been following your son or whether we um, are considering what that looks like, would you please beckon us to this table, um, beckon us to a life of desirable difficulty? Because as we take steps along that path, we will find that that is a cross-shaped path. And so, Lord, as we come to uh, the table today, help us come with not only Roger's story in mind, but the greater story that it points to, the story of your son, his death, and his resurrection. Um, so lead us to the table. In Jesus' name, amen.